for 15 minutes. The disabled set aside like a common agricultural policy and parents with children with learning disabilities fraught with fear and fighting for their children's facilities and rights. These are the people who count and these are the people UKIP will stand up for. It's no secret. It's what UKIP do and we should be proud to say so. And so long as it is neither illegal or immoral, UKIP will stand up and fight their corner. And that's what you should expect government to do. But this lot, be they DUP, Sinn Féin, UUP, SDLP, Alliance, and some of the others, they have put party before people. But for me, it's the party that comes second. The people come first. Yeah. 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 evolution at fault. Nor is it the system at fault. It is the parties and their woeful ministers who are at fault by their incompetence, their arrogance, yes, let me say, their inability to grasp their own grief. The only minister this lot haven't introduced is a minister for excuses and bungling. Perhaps on second thought, that's what they're all good at. Talk about our victims. In this deal, there is no excuse for leaving victims out in the cold, our forgotten casualties of the past. We should be honouring the innocents caught in the line of terrorist fire, and we should be standing alongside their loved ones. And how could any party? Conjure up an agreement entitled a fresh start without including victims. Of all the people deserving a fresh start, our victims come top of my list. And just like everyone else, they too must have a future. And to exclude them or to patronize them as they're doing now with the promise of a private member's bill is really a total insult to them. Today, I call in this conference for a victim's charter, defining the victim's status, a charter which gives no recognition of anyone damaged by their own hands. Here. They are not Here. victims Here. 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 But a charter which does quite rightly recognize the damage caused by the terrorists and a charter I want to see written by the innocent victors. Putting together a rapid process to bring to an early conclusion how best their needs can be addressed. A charter for governments to action and bring closure to the people giving them real rights. We can no longer be a part of casting aside victims in the name of some phony political expediency. In the conference, I stand alongside all victims. One of those victims is my friend Michael Gallagher. And I recall him saying this, there are at least 10 people who will be sitting at their Christmas dinner this year we were involved in the Oma bomb. And the intelligence know these men. I like said, I've never spoken against their investigation team in its history. But without doubt, you cannot help feel, but feel extremely let down by what happened. And put simply, in a few weeks, this Christmas, like all Christmases before, will not be good for our victims. <coughs> Is it too much to ask that we make this the last Christmas ever when our victims haven't got the closure they need to their own separate and personal needs? I don't think it's too much to ask. And it hurts. They're constantly in our thoughts. And it is people like them I say we must stand up for because long gone 
other days when you could be called a single issue party. Four million votes for our policies in a Westminster election puts us right up there in the real contest for hearts and minds. If we got four million votes for one seat, the Scottish Nationalists got one and a half million votes for 56 seats. That's terribly wrong. But you could, we march on. And so far have we travelled that the pundits right now are talking about even our chances of overturning a 23,000 Labour majority in Oldham. Well, that's not down to just one single issue. And long gone too does the world, the word in our brand title, stand only from independence from the European Union. It's key, but today and in regions across the United Kingdom, we gather support and momentum from all sorts of people demanding, as we do, independence from the free wheelers and the free loaders, the hijackers of our causes and our policies, the usurpers of freedom and democracy who want everything but contribute nothing. They whinge, they dodge, and they bluff the people, and then they crawl back into the crevices they came from. You know them? They're the good doer hypocrites who cling on to the establishment, who are in the establishment, clamoring for high paid positions on quangos and statutory bodies as ineffective, costly hangers on, low level wasters. And you know them all the hospital board members who can't manage, the school board governors who won't stand up to the minister, the squad of civil servants who govern without accountability and the bureaucrats who roll out red tape when it suits them and the great and the good who want to mollycoddle criminals and reduce sentences. These type of chancers and more like them, they can't face up to you. Can. They can't accept our challenge because you know, you know that you could know and we're telling them that their game's up. And just like the people, you could have had enough of those having a say in government and political affairs, sticking their noses into matters they weren't elected on, on issues fighting for our identity and for justice on which they have no conscience. Yes, there surely is a fed up feeling with officialdom and their lamentable excuses and blame games, hiding their mistakes and concealing the truth. We tell the hangers on and the chancers some good news. You could bring with us that head of good feeling and we are after you and we will find you. And it's no com com coincidence to find UKIP providing leadership on two fronts. Protecting our Britishness at home, here in Northern Ireland, and protecting our sovereign identity in order to free us as a nation state from the pitfalls and the pit bulls of Europe. And I have a message for the United Irelanders, those clinging on to a pipe dream over which they will not concede that 82% of our people are not interested in a United Ireland. My message is as strong as ever. The provosts weren't successful in bombing, in mutilating, in murder, in political convincing either of pushing Northern Ireland over into submission and into a Northern Ireland unitary state. Their dirty war failed. And no matter how strong the Sinn Féin mandate remains, it is their mandate, and it's not mine, and it's not in my name, and not in my time. And on this day, coincidentally, on this day when a, another party gathers at its conference to hail the heroes coming home of yet another deal of fudge, concessions, and sweeteners for their faithful. <laughs> Let me say this to the Republicans, the Nationalists and the Unionists alike. UKIP 
will not tolerate an armed RA council in overarching control of Sinn Féin or any other party in government. Sinn Féin IRA have no place in Northern Ireland working together and I will not be working with them. Yeah. 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 think about this uh, so-called deal is for people, they say. Is it to help the armed provost leave the scene? Is it to allow or force Peter Robinson to rewrite his memoirs? Does it weaken or strengthen the union? What difference will it make to our daily lives? We know, I've spelled out where we stand on the army council, a tough uncompromising principle stand that no Democrat across the Western world would reject or argue with. Just, a minute, just, just before I get actually into this storm of deal, let me deal with a, an issue that some people want to gossip about. Let me mention briefly the TUV. You could overtrick them last time out. We have displaced them as the largest of the smaller parties. We are growing, and make no mistake, as we grow, they will move and try to move on to our ground, and they will not hold back in putting around spiteful, untruthful rumours as they've done before. They fear UKIP, and where the TV follow, they have a voice, but it's a voice people are walking away from. The TUV are against everything. UKIP, on the other hand, are a pro-self-determination, devolution party. And we are standing candidates to make things better. Better for the people. Not to wreck the system and destroy having a say in our own affairs. The TUV can go ahead and they can join with the direct rulers. The naysayers throwing in the towel now, preferring non-elected English Tories to govern us with Tory policies. Tory policies for water rates, for tax credits, against bus passes, for reducing the block grant, and Tory ministers free to govern direct rule. But it won't just be that, it will be 
joint rule with Doug. We'll go for it. Go for it, TUV and anyone else. But you go alone. And don't sell the, the pup of a, a new devolution. That's not what you're talking about. It's not new to set up a glorified county council with no powers, only scrutiny. No legislation except adopting that sent to you from London and Dublin. If you want policies from London sent to Storm to scrutinise, you can't reject them. You can't amend them. And you can only do what you're good at, and that's shouting about them. Well, shouting is no longer good enough. The people are crying out for leadership, not barkers. Let me take this head on. No punches pulled. And it's not normally my style. But the low-level cheating comment by a recent convert to TUV saying David McNary was the architect of the Good Friday Agreement, let me tell you, conference, if I had a been, it would have been a hell of a lot better than it is or was. I was not involved, not engaged, nor about. My time in government came into that with David Trimble as First Minister as his senior advisor after the agreement. In all modesty, this would have been a lot better deal than it was. And what we're demanding now in terms of money, you can rest assured that David McNary would have been demanding at that time a billion pounds. But we never got it and we're still borrowing it. So let me come back to the deal. They, they say it, it took 10 weeks in the making. And that's very funny because we thought this deal was done last Christmas. But what we have is the, the sanitized version of the deal that never was and couldn't be because Sinn Féin realized that adopting austerity here, they would be ridiculed in the Republic where they want to be in government. It is nothing but a deal for parties. It's not for people. And let, let's not escape it. It's not a real deal. It's not even a half-baked deal. It's a hotch-potch wishless putting us all into hock and leaving nothing to commend it. My initial response was, this was a half-baked day, which paints the talks parties as a bunch of political dilettantes giving cover to the armed IRA council remaining in government against the wishes of public opinion. He could want a deal. A deal which benefits people, not just political parties, particularly as those parties have all contributed substantially to the financial mess which helped bring about this deal and make it necessary in the first place. Well, we will be monitoring the delivery of this package. The 67 or 87 page version, depending on which one you read. We'll be monitoring that as the details unfold over the coming months to ensure on your behalf that it delivers real, tangible benefits for the people and it is just not a means for parties to hold on to office because it's a party we stand for a new kind of politics. It's a kind of politics which is people-centered and focuses on people's problems, not party self-interest. We made it clear. We want to see the IRA Army Council's links to Sinn Féin meaningfully ended. And we will still look for progress on that front until it happens. You kept once Northern Ireland to succeed. And for devolution to deliver a better life for all our people and a future for our children. And let me say there isn't say it again, there isn't a, a lot wrong with our system of devolved legislative government. It's not the devolution. It's the people who work it. It works in Scotland and in Wales. But our problem lies with those who are running government and running this country. For eight years, the same five parties have between them destroyed the health service, decimated the school system, ruined the roads and transport services, built little or no affordable housing.
allows us to make a difference, turn our universities into rundown campuses, put our farmers on the breadline, put jobs at risk, deterred investment, and made a mockery of justice, law, and order. They have failed the people. It is they who have been caught out time after time, and it is they, not us, who need to move on, and I say, moved out of the way and replaced. That's our job. And what is this deal? What does it do for ordinary people? What do I want you to go home and tell your friends and your relatives that this deal does? How will it prevent the stacking up of queues, of hospital waiting lists? How will it bring back our schools to satisfactory levels? provide an infrastructure for modern cities and towns, put the building industry back to work to build homes for our needy, attract the students from overseas to our universities, help the farmers to produce at prices they can live on and create new and sustainable employment, encourage investment and risk taking and return a real peace, a sense of order and good government. The honest answer, folks, is this deal doesn't impress anyone. It hasn't come into our world, the real world that we live in, the real world of real people crying out for real and positive leadership. Remember what triggered the 10 weeks of talks? It was murders by the IRA in Belfast. The existence of the IRA and the First Minister saying, this executive was not fit to govern. So after the DUP merry-go-round in and out of their departmental turnstiles, and 10 weeks for the rest of us to talk just for the sake of talking, what has changed? The murderous men have been buried, yet the IRA still exists. And we still have as a result of this deal an executive unfit to govern. And here's the rub. Mr. and Mrs. Northern Irishmen and their families are expected to gracefully and thankfully endorse an agreement with the fingerprints of the provost all over it. And shamefully we find the DUP and our British Secretary of State representing Her Majesty's government telling Mr. and Mrs. Northern Irishmen and their families, go for it, accept it, move on and move over. Well, I don't think so. Hmm. Not in my name and not in the name and judgment of the principal people that we in UK so proudly serve. No government in our Western world would accept an armed army council in their government. We have returned to the days of no guns, no government. And can you remember who coined that phrase? <laughs> it was that pathetic party behind the no guns, no government that has turned itself upside down and is sitting in government with the Armed Army Council and recommending its continuance. They are what they are, Sinn Féin IRA. We stopped saying that two years ago. The media said you can't call them Sinn Féin IRA. William Crowley would have jumped out your throat for saying it. <laughs> They're back to what they were and what they are. They are Sinn Féin IRA. And like you I heard on, on Monday, <coughs> the Deputy First Minister giving his interpretation of this agreement. He said as a result of the agreement, and he said it with a straight face, as if the lights of the Castlereagh Holding Centre were shining on him, he said armed gangs and criminals would be chased down. And Martin McGuinness was only talking in the mindset about chasing down dissident Republicans. <coughs> Why? simple. <coughs> he says there is no IRA. Mm -hmm. The IRA don't exist according to Mr. McGuinness. 
And the problem, Deputy First Minister, with that is you are spoofing. The Chief Constable said they existed. Peter Robinson, ten weeks ago, agreed with the Chief Constable. And not only was the Chief Constable correct in his belief, the Secretary of State Security Panel of Experts verified the Chief Constable's words. But they went even further. They said the IRA exists, have weapons, and that the Provo Army Council controls Sinn Féin. So let's be very circumspect when I say to you, you kid, it's intolerable, it's unacceptable, and it's a blooming disgrace that we have in government Sinn Féin under the boot and the control of their armed army council. And it is to be swept under the carpet by media commentators, by spin doctors and the great and the good, they hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil, no backbone followers of the establishment, let me say you can, you can have no better reason presented to get out there with the people and to do our level best to effect change and to send back to Stormont next May a UKIP team who will not relent until Sinn Féin with their army council are removed from Stormont. would be a fresh start. Take the guns out of government. And this agreement, you know, like others, it will unravel and wither, but it's how the process works. But meantime, how scandalous it has been for nearly a year since that last Christmas deal <coughs> to find that millions of pounds have been squandered on fines going back to London and ripping into there being no money available to ease the pain of thousands of our patients waiting on hospital appointments. The holders writers of Sinn Féin, they beat themselves when they had to climb down on welfare reform, when they agreed to send them to London a year later and they forced the transfer of power to Westminster. What kind of a government, what kind of people have we got in government? When we had that power of welfare since 1921, and in a deal with Sinn Féin, we packed it up and sent it back to London. <laughs> the transfer of power. There's no government gives back power when you have it, except our executive. Well, just now to hang on with me. I want to turn to Europe, the EU referendum campaign which our leader Nigel Farage launched in the Park Avenue Hotel on the 14th of September. And do you remember what a, what a great event and a great speech by Nigel? And and doesn't it sum up his leadership, for those you maybe don't know or haven't met him, sum up his leadership, his personality, his down-to-earth man of the people style, when despite what was, I'm sure, a very, very deserved thirst for a long pint, he took over an hour with the audience. Over 300 people wanting selfies with him. I have never seen the like of that before. And I know you could. He was very honoured by the reception and taken by the pride which we and you could share with him every time he comes here. On that night he set the scene when he said at the Park Avenue, you could have given the lead, now it is up for others to follow. So let me take up Nigel's theme and call to others. Where are you, DUP and Ulster Unionists? In which camp are you? Diane Dodds, Jim Nicholson, are you with UKIP or are you against us? Are you with, like the Tories, sitting on the fence and waiting for miracles? Because there are no miracles coming, David. 
you're not going to be able to sell Europe to the people of the United Kingdom. We hear, we count on certainties, we back up judgments, and we like people to be in control of their own minds and our destiny. We dislike jugglers, fence-sitting prevaricators, and those who blow one day this way and the next day another way. Because you could, we know exactly what we are saying and in which direction we are going. If the DUP and the UUP can't make their minds up on Europe, you can count on UKIP. Our mind is made up and we made it up a long, long time ago. I'm Northern Irish. Do I look like a European? Do I walk like a European? Do I talk like a European? Because I'm not a duck. <laughs> What's European? A mixture of hot-blooded, cold-blooded, anemic politics controlling the inner sanctity of closed shop trade barriers and conditions in a, a German-French stitch-up which bears no resemblance to the older folks when they signed it up, signed up for the original common market. It's no wonder you could want a referendum to free our country from the machinations of the European Union, keen to accept and take our money, but unwilling to recognize our right to self-determination. And it's absolutely no wonder the Prime Minister prevaricates over a referendum while he runs down his time in office. He's got four more years to go, and the country knows it, and so do his own party. And yet he's to deliver a referendum that we are going to back. We've got to bring home negotiations that we are going to back before he goes, probably to a very, very well paid job somewhere in Europe. And the truth is, he's not going to secure any of the changes to the EU treaties that most of the public want the most. He is attempting the deal of, of the century, like an estate agent selling the, the home of a, an owner without his consent. And he and his long list of dubious backers, they're losing this battle to convince the electorate across the United Kingdom that staying on in Dave's term is as safe as who the German Corbyn back in Trident. 53% remarkably, 53% of the people at this early stage, without a polling date and without the campaign debates really being electrifying, saying quit Europe. 53% saying quit Europe is a stunning verdict on Cameron and his multi-billionaire mates. But it's, it's at the right place at this time. And it's where you get going to be, even with the Republic of Ireland sticking their noses into our business. There's nothing new in that our friends and good neighbours across the border who thankfully have come a long way since harbouring terrorists and buying guns for the IRA. But I say, listen up, Mr. Kenny. Just butt out of our affairs. Stop the scaremongering that Brexit damage your economy and be disastrous for Northern Ireland businesses near the border. Not only is it a poor unwanted attempt to interfere, and not only does it not stack up, your game is up. Because, of course, I know and we know what you're trying to do. You're trying to influence hundreds of thousands of Irish votes in Britain and also here in Northern Ireland to vote against Brexit. And you're trying to muster support for David Cameron. I tell you also, Mr. Kenny, what's really upsetting you is that a Northern Ireland out of Europe is a Northern Ireland back in charge and in control of our board. 
a border you specially recognize, but allow the free movement across from your side of undesirable criminal migrants and a steady stream of economic tourists crossing through us into the rest of the United Kingdom. What irks you, Mr. Kenny, is that a border control defined once again Northern Ireland is British and not Irish. Not European, but a free country for free people. And as the only part of the United Kingdom with a land border, you can, may take this Brexit case across the border to you, Mr. Kenny, and see how you like it. And I suspect you won't like it, not at all. But I also suspect that what's going to happen one day is that when people from your country are contacting me and others saying, can we join UKIP? And they live in Dublin, and they live in Waterford, and they live in Wexford. And the only problem I have in not letting them join UKIP is, it's the United Kingdom. That movement that we are seeing here is going to happen and evolve in the Republic of Ireland. So that that said, we have a job for our country to first press home UKIP's case for exiting Europe. Our job is to deliver a message and a campaign that we will put across right into the, to the hearts and, and minds. We can't have a conference without reflecting last Friday, which showed to the world that no city can relax against the determination of ISIS. They proved in murdering innocent people in Paris, as other speakers have said, we've had 40 years of it. And again, on our news last night, more people killed in, in Mali. We simply cannot afford it. And it may sound rude and brutal, and to other people, it may sound crude, but it's not. We simply cannot afford to import murderers from migrant communities who pretend to be asylum seekers and refugees. Listen to this. Jim Cusick in the Sunday Independent, way back on August the 9th, he wrote, Sources have confirmed that there is now close Garda Shikorna special branch cooperation with other intelligent agencies, particularly American and British, to spot ISIL cells in Dublin. ISIL cells in Dublin. Kusuk went on to write, and this concerned me, he went on to write, Irish security sources have confirmed to the Sunday Independent that the radicalization of young Muslims is regarded as far more serious an issue there than so-called dissident republicanism. And the question I asked is, are we here in Northern Ireland who treat dissident republican activity extremely seriously? I'm missing a trick by not being told and by not knowing if there is a threat to our communities as is apparent down south from ISIL supporters. Because be in no doubt, all the connotations of migration <coughs> will take pole position in this referendum debate. A debate which we welcome, but which no one will welcome with the guns of ISIL held to our heads. It's bad enough that we will have guns in government than to think that we will have people in our midst in cells. We know from our experience how cells worked for the IRA. And the people of England knew how they worked there when they reflect on Brighton and Manchester. They're amongst us. We need to know who we are. We cannot live with other people's terrorists, nor should we be asked or expected to provide work for other people's unemployed. 
when our own local workers are losing their jobs? How can we provide homes when our young people languish in housing waiting lists for years? And nor should we be rushing to send 200 billion to Africa when we must get our, our own needs sorted out first? Our people understand our needs. They don't understand why we are asked to tighten our belt and yet in doing so the money is thrown away. Because last night across the United Kingdom 100,000 children slept in hostels or in bread and breakfast because there aren't enough homes for them. And tonight 8,000 of our veterans ex-servicemen will sleep on the streets across Britain. We can't be sending taxpayers' money abroad. And we can't be doing it when most foreign aid falls into corrupt hands of rich people in Africa. It never sees the light of day in helping, in helping the poor in those countries. And it's not acceptable. Harsh it may seem, but it's not acceptable to be feeding the poor in other countries when here in Northern Ireland and throughout the United Kingdom, Food banks are being overrun by our own needy party. It just isn't on. How can we have slush funds to send abroad but leave our own people ill and in pain? It's about time those slush funds for foreigners were raided and used to fund the needy in our own health service. 55 million a day wasted in Europe. Yet we have thousands waiting in pain for relief. We have mothers jockeying their budgets while we import Europe's and the world's problems, allowing, do you ever hear it? Allowing the mothers of migrants living here to send their benefits back home to where from where they came. And when a Nobel Peace Prize winning economist Professor Angus Deaton, the son of a Scottish miner now operating out of Princeton University in New Jersey, says he would like to see a ban on Britain giving money to 20 or more countries who will listen. When he says foreign aid doesn't do much good, people sit up. But it's not this government who seemingly by their treatment of others are prepared to do more from them than they are for our own people. That's not just scandalous, it's shameful. There has been so much stolen from us by you at the conference. Our identity, our national security and pride, our standards, our values, our culture, generally our way of life and the way of life we want and we want to lead it. And that includes <coughs> our decisions which I welcome <coughs> to embrace the culture of others. And when we do it, we find the majority integrating into our lifestyle, bring much for us to enjoy and benefit from them. Across Northern Ireland and in Belfast, there are many other communities that it is a great pride for me to go into their midst and enjoy their culture and to hear what they think of me and you. But what we see going wrong across the water, mark my words, will in a matter of time go wrong here, unless we prevent it. I'm talking about segregation, societal ill discipline, separation between people, separation by those who don't want to mix and who bring with them laws we would not administer. I love multicultural Britishness, but I do not want to see cultural apartheid or separateness working to the extent that it festers and turns sour. Inside Europe, we can't escape that one-size-fits-all demand that we are Europeans heading for a European constitution and a European president under the whiplash of France and Germany either swapping roles between them or putting puppets in to do their bidding. It can't go on. 
we cannot be governed from Brussels. There is no point in pretending that the United Kingdom has ever been comfortable in the EU. It's a union that this union doesn't belong in. Does anyone really think and think about it? That the Germans will stop selling us BM dollars or dodgy Volkswagen? <laughs> <laughs> that the French will, will ban us drinking their wine and the Spanish will turn us away from their resorts? Or well, the Dutch, the Belgians, the Italians, Greeks and the rest will turn their backs on us? It just won't happen. There's not a chance of it. Do they think they will stop their own people coming to, to London, Edinburgh, Cardiff, or Belfast? come and see the, the sets of the Game of Thrones, the Giants Causeway, the Titanic, or to play golf with Larry Roy. Roy. It's just a difference. But let's halt it all there where we can. That's what we're about. The message is, no one repeat, no one, not Cameron, not Merkel, not Labour, the SNP or the dithering unions, no one is going to batter UK into anything. UKIP are going for victory and UKIP are going to win. And on that subject, and I know I've gone on a bit, and thank you for being patient, what I needed to say needed to be put on record for this part. I want to say as the leader in Northern Ireland that I'm so proud of where we stand today united and determined as the UK party. I spoke to our esteemed leader and he wishes you all the best. He knows how hard we work for UK, perhaps harder than many other regions. And he knows where our heart is and he sends his best wishes. We are now a proper party. We fear no one. We can match the best and we don't see chancers in our way. The more successful that we will be, the more we will become a target. Because popularity brings with it the bitterness of foes. But we can take it and just let everyone know we're big boys and we're big girls. And we're determined to help people. We're determined to tell them UKIP belongs here. We're one in the same people as you. And if you want a champion, then choose UKIP. We will stand up and make your cause our cause. We've work to do, folks, in this <coughs> referendum and in the election. I want a team effort by the team for the team. Let me name our candidates so far chosen to stand and carry the <coughs> banner in the assembly election. <coughs> Noel Jordan in East Antrim. <coughs> Robert Hill in South Antrim. in North Antrim. Hugh <laughs> Jordan in East Belfast. <laughs> David Jones in Upper Band. <laughs> the Young Independent Stephen Parkill in East London Derby. UKIP if he was cut, Alan Love in Yuri and <laughs> Our new recruit from Leicestershire, Bill Piper in West Tyrone. <laughs> in Mid Ulster. <laughs> Stephen Crosby in Strangford, and you better hold it. Stoker in South Belfast. Ken Boyle in North Belfast. Johnny Lavery in North Dime. And last but 
but not least, Brian Higginson in Lagan Valley. <laughs> Let's give them the UKIP send off from this conference. Three cheers for our United team. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Thank you, conference. Thank you.